uh, Rob Murphy. I'm the executive director of the Institute uh, for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases and Professor of Medicine and Biomedical Engineering here at Northwestern. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for taking the time this afternoon uh, to come to our first Friday seminar series, uh, COVID-19, a global threat to the nervous system. Uh, please take a moment to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, hashtag uh, FSM Global Health. In addition, we welcome you to become an Institute for Global Health member to receive access to specialized resources and services that support research infrastructure. And for more information, uh, please visit our website, very easy website, globalhealth.northwestern.edu backslash members. Today, we are very happy uh, to have with us Dr. Igor Koralnik for discussion on uh, timely, his timely neuro COVID research and the neurologic complications of COVID-19. Igor Koralnik is the Archibald Church Professor of Neurology and Chief of the Division of Neuroinfectious Diseases and Global Neurology in the Davie Department of Neurology at Northwestern, where he studies the clinical, radiological, immunological, histological, and molecular aspects of neuroinfectious diseases. Dr. Kralnik is also the director of the Global Neurology Program within our Institute for Global Health, which aims to improve neurologic health worldwide and provide neurologic care, research, and education to underserved populations and strives to improve and facilitate the diagnosis and treatment of infections of the nervous system caused by viruses. In addition, uh, Dr. Kralnik leads the re recently opened NeuroCOVID Clinic at Northwestern Medicine, which is dedicated to the care of patients suffering uh, from neurologic manifestations of the coronavirus. He leads cutting edge research on cognitive and immunologic aspects of COVID-19. And in 2010, he established the Global Neurology uh, Research Program at the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka, Zambia, which has since grown tremendously and has become a multi-institutional consortium, Zambian Institute for Neurologic Care, Research and Education, or ZINCARE. There will be time for questions uh, following the presentation in which we welcome you to submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And now I turn it over to Dr. Igor Koralnik. Igor, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Rob, for this kind introduction, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to share my slide now. All right, you can see them. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us from all over. I'm delighted to be distancing socially with all of you today. And <clears throat> we have to realize it's already the second first Friday of 2021. And with everything that's going on in the world, personally, I feel pretty lucky to be here. You know, when you think of it, uh, instead of the second first Friday, they could have dumped me on the first second Saturday series instead. And believe me, you don't want to go there. So the way all this started with, for me was um, at the beginning of uh, January uh, of last year, I had just uh, joined Northwestern trying to figure out, you know, what is where and who is what and um, unpacking the lab when uh, uh, Jenny Nowatsky, uh, the senior media relations specialist of the hospital called me out of the blue and say, well, we need somebody on the air in 45 minutes to talk about this new virus. Can you do it? And uh, you know, probably Rob Murphy and everybody else, you know, in the hospital was busy doing something else. And I said, you know, I'm a neurologist. This is a respiratory disease. You really need me from for that. And she said, you know, the website mentions you're neuroinfectious something or other. That's all they want. They wouldn't see the difference anyway. I'll pick you up in ten minutes. And you can see that at that time, um, you know, people were still sitting next to each other smiling, you know, despite the fact that there was no toilet paper to be found anywhere. And I was just happy to be there and represent the university in the, my, my department, tell people how to cover their cough and, uh, you, know, um, you know, wash their hands. And uh, I felt somewhat still uneasy to be there constantly in the news to talk about the disease I'd never seen and a virus I did not do any research on. So fast forward one year, we live in a completely different world now, as you know, um, and um, you basically uh, know the, the figures, more than 100 million uh, infected cases, uh, which is probably an underestimate with the 2.2 million deaths, um, and the US leading the way, the wrong way, with um, you know more than 26 million 
uh, cases and 450 or more thousand deaths uh, with the first surge, second surge, third, third surge, you know, as you know them. And <clears throat> uh, we are going to be very short on the basic science of coronaviruses, which you have heard time and time again before. Um, these are uh, uh, the name of coronavirus comes from the appearance on MRI with the spike protein looking like a crown here. And uh, uh, these are correspond to many different families occurring in many different animal species. Uh, the envelope, I mean, the, the, this is an, um, a, a virus that has multiple protein uh, on, on the surface and the Skype spike protein is the major one. But you also have the nuclear capsid, you can see here. And this is important in terms of uh, serological tests that are uh, developed to measure antibodies against this virus. But this is the spike protein that here connects with the ACE2 receptor that allows the virus to enter cells. We're infected through aerosolized droplets. And you've been told that uh, you can only go you know, six feet from other people and be safe. But in fact, when people sneeze or cough, the droplets can go up to 25 feet. And <clears throat> this is also why you can also be infected through the conjunctiva. So the first paper that was uh, ever published on allergy complication of COVID-19 came out of uh, Wuhan, China, and um, showed uh, in these 214 hospitalized patients that Nordic manifestations occur in 36.4 of uh, those and 45.5 of those who had severe cases. These included dizziness, headache, mild jazz, alteration of consciousness, dysgeusia, anosmia, and strokes. And that showed for the first time that SARS-CoV-2 frequently affects the nervous system in patients in China. And you can see here a CAT scan <clears throat> of um, you know, uh, the lung of a patient and uh, ischemic stroke in the same patients. Soon thereafter, a paper came out of uh, Europe in Spain in 841 hospitalized patients, and they showed that 57.4% had neurologic symptoms, including also alteration of consciousness, mild jazz, headache, dizziness, dysgeusia, anosma, stroke, and seizures, which <clears throat> confirmed that SARS-CoV-2 also frequently affects the nervous system in Europe. And here you can see an MRI of one of these patients with hyperintense signal in uh, a clear image on in the, the, the temporal lobe. So the question that came upon us is what's happening in the US? Well, um, the way it happened is that uh, Jeff Clark, who the first, was a first year med student, uh, contacted me back in uh, April, I think last year, and he was interested in <clears throat> doing a neuroinfectious disease summer project and um, at that time, I'd already contacted the neurocritical care attendings, Dr. Ayush Batra and Eric Liotta in our department who were actually caring for COVID patients in the neuro ICU. And we put our heads together and said, well, it would be important and interesting to see what's happening in our hospital and review, let's say, the first 500 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 at Northwestern, see what kind of neurologic uh, complication they may have. And because it was a big job, so Nathan Schlobin and Stephen Hoffman came out uh, to the rescue. And uh, Northwestern first NeuroCOVID summer camp was born, complete with uh, MS team activities where we were meeting to discuss all those issues under the watchful eye of my clinical coordinator, Zach Orban. <clears throat> so the students um, got a little bit more than what they bargained for because they just wanted to do a chart review of some sort, but they had to appraise the literature, did an EDW pool of all COVID patients at Northwestern since the onset of the pandemic in Chicago, design a retrospective chart review of hospitalized patients, and review the first 509 patients during the lockdown, analyze the data, and the paper was actually published in uh, October 2020. So frequent neurologic manifestation and encephalopathy associated morbidity in COVID-19 patients. So the period of the was March 5 to um, April 6. <clears throat> the mean age was 58.5 and 55.2% were male. We characterized severe respiratory disease as requiring intubation and only 26.3% of those patients at Northwestern required intubation, which is less than in other places. At the time of the uh, symptom onset, 
you can see that 42.2% of patients had neurologic manifestation. And anytime during COVID-19, 82.3% have some neurologic manifestations. So at the time of symptom onset, the main manifestation were myalgias and headache, but you also have others, including encephalopathy in rare cases. And, but generalized fatigue was already prominent, 42.9% of cases. And anytime during symptom onset, we see again, myalgia and fatigue on top of the list, but now encephalopathy is on the third place, 31.8% had encephalopathy, which means alteration of consciousness or um, uh, intellectual functions that can go from minor confusion all the way to coma. Um, and so these six manifestations con uh, constituted 91.4 of all of the neurotic manifestations in our hospital. Yes, we also had ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, movement disorder, ataxia, and so on, but these were few and far between. And interestingly, we had no Guillain-Barre syndrome or ADEM in our first 500 patients. Generalized fatigue, which we don't consider a typical neurologic problem, it's more generalized you know, problem, occurred in 79.4 of all patients. We wanted to know <clears throat> what the clinical characteristic led to you know, one or the other manifestations. And we looked at patients with no neurologic manifestation or any neurologic manifestation, no encephalopathy and encephalopathy. And you can see that patients with any neurologic manifestation, interestingly, were younger than the one with no neurologic manifestation, whereas those patients with encephalopathy were constantly older, 65.5 years old, which is 55, uh, in those with no encephalopathy. There was no difference between male and female for any neurologic manifestation, but patients with encephalopathy tended to be mainly male, 62.3% versus 37.7%, and come to the hospital sooner after symptom onset, six versus seven days, whereas the patient with any neurologic manifestation tended to come to the hospital a bit later after symptom onset than the others. We looked at markers of inflammation in patients with or without no manifestation and encephalopathy. And not surprisingly, patients with encephalopathy had higher white blood cell count, C-reactive protein, D-dimer, ferritin, procalcitonin, whereas there was no difference in those with any neurologic manifestation compared to those with no neurologic manifestation. So we looked at association with disease severity. And as you can see here, 84.3% of patients with encephalopathy were actually intubated in the ICU, uh, compared to 13.1% uh, who were not, you know, need, did not need mechanical ventilation. In terms of um, uh, association and outcome, we found that patients with encephalopathy tended to be, you know, male and older, as we said, uh, intubated, but also had prior history of neurological disorder chronic kidney disease, heart failure, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. And they had a longer hospital stay, obviously. And uh, But uh, what was striking is that 32.1% uh, of uh, those after discharge uh, had a poor cognitive outcome, uh, modified ranking scale 0 0.2 at discharge. That means you are able to uh, take care of your own affairs. So only one third of patients with encephalopathy uh, were able to carry, uh, take care of their own affairs after discharge. And the mortality was much higher in patients with encephalopathy, 21.7% versus 3.2% of those with no encephalopathy. And mind you, the mortality in our hospital system was fairly low, 9.1% overall, uh, compared to, for example, in New York City, where the mortality was about 20% because their system was overloaded uh, at some point, whereas ours was not. So as you know better than me, Northwestern uh, Memorial, Memorial Healthcare or Northwestern Medicine has a network of 10 hospitals, including our academic center and uh, uh, all others. And we had the occasion to look at the patient characteristic at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, the academic medical center, and all other hospitals, because we had about the same number of patients in each. 
And uh, we saw that the di uh, population diversity was higher in uh, the academic medical center, depending on the you know, characteristics of the people living around here, compared to those in the other hospitals. But um, we found also that patients at the Northwestern Memorial Hospital were um, sicker in a sense. They had more neurologic manifestation, more comorbidities, and more likely to be intubated. However, um, the DNR, DNI, and comfort measure only were more frequently given at all other hospitals, and the outcome and mortality was also worse in other hospitals uh, compared to the academic medical center. So altogether, it's not too surprising. It's been shown for sepsis already that patients uh, who, for example, have sepsis all over the world tend to do better when they go to the academic medical center and when there's a high volume of patients being taken care of uh, with the same condition. All right, so how do we understand the geographic differences between the US, Europe, and China for neurologic manifestation? Well, first, there may be a different genetic, genetic background with the ACE2 receptor polymorphism be between these different populations. There may be already variation of SARS-CoV-2 strains. And uh, I think the most important is the difference in severity of COVID-19 in different geographic area, because in our hospital, we only had one, one quarter uh, had severe disease and our hospital was never overloaded. Um, you can understand if every, every patient coming to the hospital needs to be intubated right away, then doctors will have less opportunity to ask them you know, if they were dizzy or if they had anosmia or dyspepsia and so on. Uh, but altogether, uh, everybody saw that encephalopathy was really a major contributor to poor outcome and mortality. And now we have many more data mining studies ongoing with um, seven med students actually working with us on those projects. Uh, something interesting that I discovered because of this paper is the um, uh, altmetrics score or media attention score of a given paper. And um, this is uh, recorded on this website and our paper has an altmetric score of 2100. Uh, you can see all the news blogs, policy documents, which is one of them is from the WHO here, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Wikipedia, and others where the paper has been quoted. And you have a breakdown that tells you that uh, Altmetrics tracked more than 16.7 million uh, output. And this paper is a 99 percentile, top 5% of all research output ever tracked by Altmetrics. So it was a discovery for me. Uh, usually we looked at the impact factor of the journals or cit citation index, which can take a lot of time. But here you can see how the paper is, uh, has been seen in the entire world in the news and so on. All right. So how can we understand the mechanism of encephalopathy, for example? Well, there was a very interesting paper that came out uh, from uh, Switzerland, actually, where they looked at um, uh, MR vessel wall imaging in patients with uh, delayed awakening post-mechanical ventilation. These patients were negative for SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR in the CSF, did not have any other cause of encephalopathy but they saw an enhancement of wall of basal skull arteries uh, in those patients, as you can see here on the arrows, there, here, and here, which with no stenosis of the arteries and no thickening of the vessel wall. So it was not really a vasculitis, but more likely an endothelitis or endothelialitis. Those patients were treated with prednisone, and uh, some had marked improvement in alertness. And based on these uh, findings, um, also other people showed that you can have uh, a productive infection of um, the coronavirus in uh, uh, the endoth endothelial cells in other organs. We have started to do vessel wall MRI imaging also here at Northwestern in our patient population. Now, what do we know about um, autopsy series, post-mortem examination, can we find the virus in the brain? Well, uh, these are few and far between because it's dangerous, obviously, to do that. Uh, we need to have special equipment and special uh, negative pressure autopsy room in order to be doing that safely. The most interesting study came from Germany in the Lancet. They looked at 43 
post-mortem of uh, uh, patient with COVID-19, found ischemic infarct, astrogliosis, as you can see here, infiltration of CD8 T cell in some patients. Um, they found also SARS-CoV-2 RNA or proteins in the brain of 53% of patients tested, but these were really few and far between, as you can see here, one cell that expressed the nuclear capsid, one cell with a spike protein, and, but uh, interestingly, you can see that uh, in this cranial nerve, which is either the vagus or, or the glossopharyngeal nerve, you can see also some uh, cells that were infected, and that can help uh, understand a little bit the uh, neuropathogenesis of this virus. Although I have to say that these uh, studies need to be uh, replicated, and some people who have uh, tried here in the US found many negative results. So this is uh, our view of the world. Back in July, when I had to uh, write with uh, my um, friend Ken Tyler um, a review article on the topic, uh, we thought that the um, main ways the virus can affect the nervous system is first by systemic disease through uh, multi-organ failure, coagulopathy, inflammation, but also by CNS invasion. And uh, now we have um, uh, online uh, in uh, EPIC, the RT-PCR for SARS-CoV-2 in the CSF. You can order it in your patient population. But uh, post-infectious and immune-mediated mechanism could be also important. So um, we opened a neuro-COVID clinic at uh, Northwestern Memorial, Memorial Hospital back in May 2020, as uh, Rob just told you. It was open initially in patients on web visit only uh, from the entire United States. And since July, we have a mix of in-person and telehealth visit as well. So it started just with uh, me and our uh, neuroimmunology fellow, but uh, soon thereafter, because of the high demand, we needed to add um, advanced practice providers, uh, rotating neurology resident. Uh, we have a whole team working together and everybody says hi. Um, so this patient has been open uh, with total access. People don't need to be referred by a physician and they also did not need to have a positive SARS-CoV-2 test to be seen in our clinic. Um, because of the very high demand and at some point we were booked 14 months in advance, we uh, needed to have a completely invent a completely business completely different business model for this clinic and we enlisted uh, eight other providers in our department who would uh, agree to see those patients using our neuro covid template in their own clinic and after that uh, i will see every of these patients in a subsequent 15 minute televisit in a monthly wrap up neuro covid visit together with an app so every patient will have the opportunity to meet me, ask all questions, and participate to our uh, cutting-edge research, which I will tell you about. And we also have all those other providers in these different specialty uh, who are uh, helping see those patients when they are referred to them. Um, before I start with the NeuroCovid outpatient clinic, just to remind you that there is no gold standard for uh, test for SARS-CoV-2 infection. The RT-PCR nasal swab detects uh, the, 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 the virus only if there is nasal pharyngeal shedding. And the initial serology test for Abbott from Abbott was actually calibrated with hospitalized patients looking for antibodies against the nucleocapsid of uh, the virus. So it certainly was not sensitive enough to detect individuals with asymptomatic or mild disease. The way I explained to my patient is as if you have a pregnancy test that turns only positive in the third trimester. It's really not good enough if you only have missed one period. Now, the newer serology tests, for example, the Siemens uh, test, look for antibodies against the spike protein. They are more sensitive, but they may be still falsely negative in patients who are exposed months prior to, due to decreasing antibody titers, for example. So uh, many of you, uh, like uh, I uh, did, um, you know, uh, did the ultimate sacrifice and prick their own fingers to get blood uh, sample for the scan study that we're doing at Northwestern, which is another um, uh, uh, ways of detecting antibodies against the spike protein. 
All right, so this is our non-hospitalized COVID-19 long haulers study. And long haulers comes from this, you know, the, the name that uh, those patients have chosen for themselves uh, uh, by reference to those long haul drivers who carry very heavy load for a very long period of time. It was, um, it's a prospective study of the first 100 patients presenting to the NeuroCovid clinic between May and November 2020. We had televisit only at the beginning and then in person and televisits. Um, and uh, we did not need or did not require physician referral or positive antibody tests or nasal swab tests to get those patients in the study. And we studied 50 SARS CoV 2 positive, 50 SARS CoV 2 negative long haulers, but we had inclusion criteria. That means you'd still need to be to, to have IDSA clinical symptoms of COVID 19 starting February 2020 or later, that means when we started seeing patients with COVID-19 in Chicago, no hospitalization for pneumonia or hypoxemia, and neurologic symptoms persisting at least six weeks from symptom onset, which is uh, uh, what we decided as the cutoff. So you will see a lot of uh, gra uh, uh, table now showing the overall patients, 150 SARS-CoV-2 positive, 50 SARS-CoV-2 negative and uh, the p-value. So our outpatient clinic population was considerably younger than the inpatient population. The mean age was 43.2 years old. And interestingly, 70% were female. 52% were seen in televisits, 48% in person. And those who were SARS-CoV-2 positive were tested either by RT-PCR or by serology. So you can see that not everybody you know, got two tests, only 32% uh, of patients got the two positive tests. Some people tested negative with the nasal swab, negative with the serology. All right, so in the terms of comorbidities, um, we found that depression and anxiety fairly prominent in this patient population. 42% of them uh, had depression and anxiety before COVID but also 16% had a autoimmune disease prior to COVID, and these are listed uh, down there, which is higher than the general population. And has probably something to do with the pathophysiology of the long haul syndrome as well. Um, in terms of their clinical presentation, patient came uh, um, a mean 5.3 months after the symptom onset to the clinic. And the SARS-CoV-2 negative tend to come later than the SARS-CoV-2 positive. That's probably explained by the fact that they were bouncing around from provider to provider, trying to find somebody who was actually interested in taking care of them. We ask patients, what is your subjective impression of recovery prior to, you know, based to, uh, compared to COVID, uh, prior to COVID baseline? That means if you're 100% then you 100% recover back to normal. And in fact, um, after a mean of 5.3 months, this, the, the, the mean uh, subjective impression of recovery was only 63.9%. Patients had a median of five neurologic symptoms and 85% of them had four or, or more neurologic symptoms at the time of the, um, the office visit. So which are those symptoms? Well, the major one is brain fog, which you probably have heard many times in the news. Um, and that uh, is also a colloquial, colloquial term that is you know, chosen by the, the uh, long holders to describe their difficulties with um, attention, memory, uh, multitasking abilities, and so on. Headache, numbness, tingling, dysgeusia, anosmia, myalgia, dizziness, pain other than chest were frequent those patients in addition to blurred vision and tinnitus. And those population of patients, the positive versus the negative are fairly undistinguishable except for uh, anosmia, more frequent in the SARS-CoV-2 positive patient, whereas blurred vision is more frequent in SARS-CoV-2 negative patients. In terms of other symptoms, uh, they, most of them had fatigue, fairly prominent and debilitating in this patient population, as well as um, 
depression and anxiety, but also shortness of breath and chest pain, despite the fact that they never had pneumonia or hypoxemia. They also have insomnia, variation of heart rate and blood pressure, and gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, and so on. And um, the only thing that distinguished the SARS-CoV-2 positive and negative is that the negative had more frequent variation of heart rate and blood pressure, including a kind of a POTS-like syndrome. All right, in the neurologic exam, we had an abnormal exam in 53% of all patients, mainly uh, with deficit in uh, short-term memory and attention. Sensory dysfunction could only be tested in the in-person patients. And you can see that uh, the difference in the uh, cranial nerve dysfunction is present, uh, was only uh, detected in SARS-CoV-2 positive patients and not in SARS-CoV-2 negative patients. We did some um, uh, diagnostic testing these patients, and they had this done also in different places prior to coming to see us. Uh, I don't have the time to go into detail, but uh, those were either normal or non-specific in few, <clears throat> few of the patients. And that was dictated by their uh, clinical workup. What is more interesting is to spend a bit more time on their patient-reported outcome for cognition and fatigue. So this is called PROMIS, Patient-Reported Outcome Measure Information System, which you probably know about. And this is for cognition, the T-score, the lower the T-score, the worse the cognition, and the higher the T-score for fatigue, the worse the fatigue. And you can see here the SARS-CoV-2 positive on the, on the left and SARS-CoV-2 negative. And both population had worse quality of life uh, measure for cognition and fatigue than a normative population, um, but not any difference between the SARS-CoV-2 positive, SARS-CoV-2 negative. On the right, you can see the cognitive uh, standardized cognitive test administered through the NIH toolbox, which is a tablet-based um, uh, test for uh, processing speed, attention, executive function, and working memory. And again, you see the T-score here. So 50 would be average compared to your age, gender, race, and level of education. So we have normative population for those tests. And you can see that some patient here ace the test, some patient flung the test really, uh, and it's not a heter heterogeneous population. But if you look on aggregates, the SARS-CoV-2 positive tended to be worse attention and working memory compared to a normative population. And uh, that was not actually found in the SARS-CoV-2 negative patients. So we ask every patient, what is their subjective impression of recovery compared to pre-COVID baseline uh, when they came to the clinic? And you can see this graph uh, here on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, the time from symptom onset in months. And we had patients coming between you know, six, months, uh, six weeks from symptom onset to about nine months from symptom onset. And we were really hoping that the longer you had the, 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 you were from the symptom onset, the better off you would feel. But actually, that was not the case. There was no linear relation. Some patients felt 100% you know, recovered after two months. Some patients felt 0% recovered after you know, almost nine months. Um, that was a bit sobering to, to uh, realize that. And uh, uh, we asked also patients if they had missed more than 10 days of work and 48% of them said yes. And actually the SARS-CoV-2 negative patient tend to miss more work than the SARS-CoV-2 positive. All right, so in conclusions, we have prominent and persistent brain fog and fatigue in long rollers. They have impaired quality of life in areas of cognition and fatigue. And on standardized tests, we can measure that they have uh, impaired attention and working memory, uh, at least in SARS-CoV-2 positive patients. The SARS-CoV-2 negative patients pose a very big diagnostic dilemma. Uh, many times they are not taken seriously by uh, medical providers 
they bounce around from place to place. People tell them it's all in your head. You know, you should do yoga, relaxation. You don't have COVID and so on, which really uh, stigmatize those patients and add insult to injury. Um, we found a very high female to male ratio and prevalence of pre-existing autoimmune disease, which altogether is consistent with the post-infectious autoimmune etiology uh, of long COVID-19. And you know already that uh, female are more likely to have MS and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and other autoimmune disease. The time from symptom onset was not a good predict predictor of recovery for uh, the group of the patients that we had in the clinic, but everybody tends to improve over time. But we have to say that it's an individual trajectory and can't be predicted from the group. We don't know exactly what is the denominator of these patients, uh, the long holders, um, but uh, we can estimate that there are millions of people in the world that are affected by the long COVID syndrome, and that's going to pose a significant impact on the workforce. And based on the success of our neuro COVID clinic, now we have a, a comprehensive COVID-19 center at uh, the hospital, uh, which is a multidisciplinary uh, center uh, for the total care of post-acute COVID. A patient can come either in person or televisit, um, and uh, there's one phone number to call. All right, so one of the first neuro-COVID patients who came to my clinic uh, back, I think, in, 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 in May uh, of last year is a scientist. And scientists, you know, like data and look at data and graph it. And he came to my clinic with this graph um, and uh, showing me his uh, percent recovered uh, versus days from symptom onset. And uh, he, had, uh, he showed me that first he had respiratory and gastrointestinal symptoms followed by neuropathic and respiratory symptoms. And when I saw that, I said, well, how am I going to figure it out if I see the patient only you know, one time or you know, every six months? How am I going to figure this out if you really have all those fluctuations? And um, at the same time, I was contacted by another med student, uh, Shreyas Baradwaj, who just so happened to have spent uh, a one year at IBM Watson before coming to Med School Northwestern and uh, add an epiphany. And I say, well, we need an app for that. And actually, uh, we have been working at uh, this together. And um, I don't know if you can, you can see that. This is the NeuroCOVID recovery app, which is now test flighting on my phone. And yes, there's something uh, like this. And these are the, the screenshot. Um, you are welcome. You put your six digit ID. Uh, you answer a question about the test, you get in, and then you can answer all your different uh, symptoms um, you know, every day, and um, you choose your percent recovery to pre-COVID baseline, and you click submit, and you should be able to see your own graph, your road to recovery from COVID-19. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll be able to pull this off, and if we're able to do that, then there's no reason why we couldn't create an app for every other disease known to man call me narrow-minded, because I think it's very important for patients to have an active part in, in tracking their road to recovery, no matter what kind of disease they have. So the, this is a global health talk. So I want to show that we're quite global, at least in the US. This is the national reach uh, of the NeuroCovid Clinic via by telemedicine. We've seen uh, 290 patients so far. 70% um, in 70% in Illinois and 30 other states, including Hawaii. We have a very high demand, so the appointment volume is still growing. And uh, beyond the U.S., there is the entire world. And you may or may not know that uh, we have uh, an international health breakthrough clinical care and cutting edge research webinar series that is uh, uh, broadcast to the Far East and the uh, uh, Middle East and everywhere in the world. And we had the occasion to talk about uh, COVID-19 and the brain. And we have a whole team that is uh, now trying to put together an international remote second opinion platform where you could you know, be basically be contacted by physicians taking care of patients all over the world and help them resolve those cases. 
All right, so we also do uh, basic science research in my lab. And I just show you one slide. Uh, we are a T cell lab, so we're looking at the T cell response to SARS CoV 2 spike peptide pools um, of patients either who were hospitalized with or without um, encephalopathy. The, as you can see here, the uh, COVID neuro patients who are positive for the virus, those who are negative for the virus. Outpatients were found to be COVID positive just by uh, a random test and healthy control. And the Ellis spot, basically, you put cells in wells, you uh, add uh, peptides of the virus, and you measure production of cytokines using um, you know, uh, the, the, the spot forming unit. You can see here all the different spots that you can measure with uh, the Ellis spot reader, and you can quantify that accordingly. And you can see that um, the inpatients uh, who had COVID pneumonia secrete IL-2 uh, when stimulated, uh, you know, their, their PBMC is stimulated by all the different pools of the spike protein. But um, for example, uh, when you look for interferon gamma, the production is very skewed toward the S2 uh, peptide pool corresponding to the uh, RBD, the, the receptor binding domain. And uh, this uh, is uh, different for the COVID uh, patient who are seropositive or SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR positive in uh, the clinic, uh, but they have a robust response, whereas those who are the negative patients have a weaker response that correspond more to those of a healthy control, but the numbers are still fairly small and we need more, um, more work to be able to tell you whether whether uh, there's some, some of the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 negative patients in the clinic who still have a immune response mediated by T cell that we can discover. All right, this is the lab team uh, working uh, day and night to get those results through. And it's not trivial actually to uh, do research with the COVID positive blood. Um, now the very, uh, you know, the most frequently asked question in my talks is what's going to happen uh, with the future uh, and where are we going there? And so I want to share a Yogi Berra quote, who was uh, this famous uh, baseball player, but also an intentional philosopher who said, uh, it's tough to make prediction, especially about the future. And because of that, I retooled my game and I got myself this um, crystal ball where I can exactly see what's going to happen. And I'm going to tell you now. So uh, why should first, why should global health experts get involved in COVID-19 research or COVID-20, 21, 22? Well, you get the picture. Uh, first, we all understand now that SARS-CoV-2 is unlikely to disappear. We have third waves, variants. We don't know about the efficacy of vaccines. Uh, this is a new multi-system syndrome and there's plenty of unresolved issues of management, no cure in sight. We already have the long COVID. And on the other hand, there's a tremendous talent and expertise among global health experts. So we really need all brains on deck, so to speak. And if you don't trust me, let's just or ask this guy. Yes, and I didn't, I won't, I'm not gonna tell you I told you so because I kind of already did. So uh, the silver lining in all this is that we don't need to you know, try to explain the importance of global health to people like we used to do in the past. And I just want to say a few words about our global NORSI program in Zambia. Zambia is this country about the size of Texas, 18 million people, high HIV seroprevalence, but only five neurologists versus more than 660 in Illinois. And my mentee, the, Dr. Siddiqui, has been there living full-time since 2010 doing a research on HIV and TB meningitis, for example. So um, there are 57,000 COVID reported cases in Zambia to date and 800 deaths. Uh, and so this is low, obviously, but uh, we were wondering if the outcome of COVID-19 in HIV is different than in uh, other uh, population. Maybe less immune response is better maybe the role of art, or this is a young population. In fact, it's probably not the case. And there was a, just a recently a postmortem study that was uh, posted on the Med Archive showing that uh, 
19.2 percent of uh, patients who had postmortem tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR. Most deaths occurred in the community and were not tested anti-mortem. That means that the real COVID-19 burden is probably underestimated in Africa. All right, the, we work out of the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka. This is round with the med students and interns. This is EPIC in Zambia, if you like it. These are the medical charts of the patients. And um, we are very proud that in 2018, we launched the first Norgi residency training program in Zambia in presence of US Ambassador Daniel Foot. And uh, these are the first five, uh, three pediatric, uh, sorry, two pediatric and three adult neurology residents were enrolled in the program and they graduated successfully um, last year. So those are the neurologists who actually are taking care of patients with neurologic complication of COVID-19 in Lusaka as we speak. So we created uh, this uh, institute, uh, Zambia Institute for Neurological Care Research and Education. Um, I hope you can all distinguish that this is supposed to be a brain. It's a crowdsourced logo, actually. And we had many visitors from all over the world uh, over the past 10 years, attendings, residents, fellow medical students. And we hope to be able to send uh, two neurology residents every year in elective uh, as part of their residency training program here at Northwestern. So uh, in parting, I can't help but uh, put together in contrast the two pandemics, uh, the AIDS pandemic in the 80s and the uh, COVID-19 pandemics. It's time for my hashtag unsolicited advice for at young people. And if you totes dig this, then you probably know who you are, OMG, L, O, L. So uh, back then we had a new retrovirus, now we have a new coronavirus, both cause neurologic manifestation. We had behavior at risk for HIV. Now it can happen to everyone. I don't know if you remember those who were there taking care of patients, but uh, back then at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, there was a huge societal backlash and reluctance. Now there's a huge societal interest and acceptance. Uh, back then global health was really in, the, in, in its infancy. I'd never heard of that. And now global health is booming. And when I said, you know, when I was a student um, in Switzerland, I said, well, you know, this is really fascinating. I want to be a neurologist. I want to be a neuro HIV specialist and, and figured out what's happening with those patients. People were really scratching their head and said that you need to be crazy in order to, um, to, to get involved in this. Um, but now uh, I think that uh, if you're young, energetic and you want to make a difference, I think you'd be crazy not to, and you can become a COVID-19 neurologist. So um, as a matter of fact, we actually are recruiting a NeuroID, neuroimmunology specialist to uh, join us in the division, take care of all those patients and do all the research with us. So if you know anybody who would uh, be interested, please feel free to spread the word. And uh, I want to uh, thank all my collaborators from the NeuroCovid clinic, the NeuroCovid team, including seven medical students working with us, uh, all the lab team, unsung heroes from the department, of course, the COVID-19 patients, their families, and all our uh, funders. And um, in parting, a, a good recipe for longevity during pandemic time is always keep your head up high, no matter what, like this, and wear a mask. Thank you very much and stay safe. Igor, thank you. Thank you so much for the fantastic presentation. Um, really appreciated it. Uh, the, there's a couple questions here. Uh, some of the questions came in a little early, so uh, you've addressed them, but um, maybe just a couple little specifics. I wanted the first one that you talk a lot about the gender differences uh, with uh, neurologic syndromes, uh, but could you, uh, do, is there any information on um, neural symptoms uh, uh, at, at all related to menstruation? That's an excellent question. So some of our patients say that um, uh, their, their symptoms tend to uh, ebb and flow together with the, the, the periods, um, but it's uh, unfrequent, I would say. 
and uh, among the long haulers, uh, female who have brain fog and fatigue and dizziness and headache, it tends to be pretty con uh, constant, really. We haven't tried to dissect that because we only found that in, in few people actually in the clinic. Mm. How about does, um, you talked about anosmia, but uh, does loss of taste or smell have any uh, initial prognostic uh, significance? That's what we thought initially because, um, you know, in order to have anosmia, you need to have infection of the olfactory yeah. mucosa, which is just below the cribriform plate, just below the brain. Mm. And you could think that the virus could go from there into the olfactory bulb and then to the temporal lobe and cause encephalopathy. It's actually not the case. And we have patients who have just transient anosmia that, that uh, lasts only a couple of weeks at this onset and then becomes you know, normal again, but they have prominent brain fog, headache, dizziness for months. And on the other hand of the spectrum, we have patients who only have anosmia dysgeusia and then carry that for you know eight to nine months, and they say, well, you know, I feel, you know, I I, I smell phantom smells, bleach, you know, or you know, rotten smell, and food tastes disgusting all the time, but they don't have the brain fog and and, and headache, and so we don't really understand exactly uh, what what's causing this or the other one, and that's why we're doing the studies to try to figure it yeah. out. Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> What treatments are you offering patients with post-COVID syndrome? Do you use IVIG, any uh, specific treatments offered? So um, everybody who comes to the clinic has a one hour evaluation and that leads to a differential diagnosis. So you may have COVID and headache uh, because of COVID, but you can have COVID and headache because of migraine or because of brain tumor, right? So there's a differential diagnosis for everything. Uh, we treat patients symptomatically you know, with headache, uh, with uh, fatigue, with pain, um, or with dizziness, for example. There are different types of medications. We also try to prevent other people to do bad things to our patients. So, for example, um, you know, there may be patients who come and they have been treated with uh, all kinds of steroids and have complications of that, or IVIG and got uh, aseptic meningitis, you know, from that. Um, and so um, at this point, it's a symptomatic treatment, but uh, we have to have a, a broad differential. And we have diagnosed patients who did not have COVID actually with rheumatoid arthritis or beginning of MS or migraine or so on. And they are, these are treated differently. Mm -hmm. Many of the, another question here, many of the symptoms uh, sound very similar to uh, uh, of the long haulers or like fibromyalgia. Um, another disorder with female prevalence. Were any fibro medications ever used or helpful? So that's an interesting um, question. And obviously we're aware that the chronic fatigue syndrome, post-concussion syndrome, post-chemotherapy brain fog, or fibromyalgia has overlapped right with the long COVID syndrome. Um, it's too early to tell whether one is going to morph into the other. Um, some patients have tried uh, naltrexone, other things. So far, there's not, 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 not a single medication that comes in as being you know, successful in this setting. But now that we have cohorts of patients, who would be in a position to, to test that prospectively? Um, another question, are, you, are we sure there's no actual virus in the brain? All right, so it took me like three months to petition the, 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 the new test subcommittee of the PATH lab to accept to do SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR in the CSF in, at Northwestern. Now it's finally online. It's very tough to find in EPIC, but uh, by digging, digging deep, you can. Uh, and hopefully people will be able to do that. Um, I think that the, the people who have tried in other publications all over the world found it very rarely in the CSF. Um, it is possible that uh, the viral load is so low that you are below the level of detection of the assay, um, but it is possible that it remains latent or quiescent in endothelial cell, actually, uh, of uh, brain vessels like the vertebral and basilar artery, and that could cause the, some of the symptoms that we see in this patient population without infecting the brain directly. Have you done lumbar punctures in any of these patients? Uh, have you measured antibodies in spinal fluid? 
So personally, uh, we haven't done that. And uh, there's no uh, way to uh, measure antibodies in spinal fluid at Northwestern. In, if, or if you want to do that, you have to do an intrathecal production of antibodies. You have to measure the antibodies in the CSF compared to the plasma and also look at the ratio of albumin. It's complicated. Uh, I think that few patients in a few places who did that um, uh, did that uh, on the research base, and there may be some increased uh, uh, production in patients with encephalopathy, but um, this should be explored further. Um, how does the rate of neurologic symptoms uh, from COVID compare to other viral infections, even like influenza? All right. Well, um, everybody had maybe a flu or influenza or cold, and they, they know that they may have myalgias and sometimes arthralgias and headache and um, sometimes anosmia if you have rhinitis also at the same time. But you don't really see you know, this rate of encephalopathy, and you don't see the persistent brain fog and anosmia, persistent anosmia, dysphagia, and so on. Uh, also, the, the, the population of patients, the flu is like the younger and the older, and uh, here this is not the case you know, in, in uh, COVID-19. So it's a completely different, uh, different disease. Um, here's a global question. There's so much talk about the African exception. Apart from Africa being many different countries, some of which uh, are not even doing any mm -hmm. testing or, or admitting <laughs> there's a, a pandemic going on like Tanzania, do you think this is a real or a function of underreporting and testing? So that was the basis of my last slide, right? Mm -hmm. When uh, we looked at this autopsy series from Zambia, where 19.2% of all autopsies were positive by SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR, which uh, and and most of the deaths occur in the community, and most of the people were not tested anti-mortem. So the African exception is probably not. You know, uh, an exception is probably an under-testing yeah, under population. Yeah, unfortunately. Are other countries, uh, the rich countries uh, and low- and middle-income countries, are, are they seeing the same kind of pattern in these long haulers? So you have to read the newspapers and you have to read, you know, be on Facebook and Twitter and, you know, <laughs> all those social media, which I read don't, I'm not too savvy in. I expect, expect that I have a Twitter account. But yes, you know, you have long haul syndrome, Facebook or, you know, uh, uh, social media in every language. It's called COVID au long cours in French, permanente COVID in Spanish, you know, it probably exists in China as well. Um, and yes, it is a big problem. And you see it in the, in the lay press uh, fairly prominently represented. And it probably uh, occurs in millions of people in the world by now. Um, last question here. Is the prevalence of anxiety and depression thought to be related to the circumstances around the whole uh, COVID uh, issue or exacerbated in people with a history of anxiety uh, as an underlying? Uh, so that's factor. difficult to tease out. You know, who is not anxious and will be depressed during the pandemic with all the hardship, you know, the health and economic and social hardship that we ha have? Uh, from asking the patients who came to our clinic, 42% had anxiety and depression before COVID. Mm -hmm. And so it's certainly exacerbated, you know, with COVID. And now we're using actually promised measure of anxiety and depression, as well as cognition, fatigue, and sleep in our patient population to try to, to determine that, you know, more uh, thoroughly. This is the last question. There were uh, single reports of skin biopsy confirmed small fiber neuropathy in patients with COVID and one after uh, somebody who took the vaccine. Could you comment on that? All right, so we um, see tingling and numbness in uh, some of our patients. Um, they are younger in general, so 42 years old in uh, uh, average. So mm -hmm. they tend not to have uh, pre-morbid uh, peripheral neuropathy for the most part. Um, we test them, you know, in patient, in person with, uh, you know, tuning fork and pin prick light touch. We, we found rarely evidence of peripheral neuropathy that could be solely attributed to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But there are cases of, uh, for example, brachial plexitis, for example, um, or radiculopathy or Guillain-Barré syndrome. So I wouldn't say it's impossible, but no. I would say it's fairly rare. All right. Igor, boy, you did a great job. As a matter of fact, we didn't get to all the questions. I, I'm very sorry. 
Uh, to those of you, I didn't get to your question, but we actually have quite a few more questions left, but we're out of time. We're right at the top of the hour. I wanna thank you, Igor, for taking the time uh, to share your experiences and tell us all the great things that you're doing. Uh, I wanna and I thank everyone for their very thoughtful questions. And I wanna invite everyone to join us uh, for the first Friday um, uh, seminar in March, uh, where Dr. Jaylene Girardin and Sarah Kobe who've been working with the state of Illinois uh, since March of 2020 uh, in their forecasting COVID-19 epidemic trends. So I, I hope you join us then. Uh, and again, thanks for joining us today. For those that have registered, a recording of the webinar will be shared via email shortly. And this concludes uh, today's webinar. Thank you again, Igor. And thank, thank you, you everyone. Goodbye. Bye.